Please turn your Bibles to John chapter 14. Today we'll be reading verses 23 through 29. John 14, 23 to 29. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the words which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me said to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. The title of our message focuses on what Jesus promised here, the helper will come. The helper will come. Jesus talked quite a bit about love in this passage. So I ask you, do you love Jesus? Way too many people will just answer yes without even thinking. But Jesus puts a test on what he calls love to determine whether or not it really is love. The test is this, he will keep my word. You will keep my word if you love me. So how many say they love Jesus, but they don't keep his word? Friends, this is rank hypocrisy. Before you keep, can keep his word, you must read it, right? Obvious, okay? We need to read our Bibles regularly, faithfully, because we need to hear the words of Jesus, okay? But to understand his word, you must study it. Now, not of us, all of us go to Bible college or seminary, but you know, we do come to church. And this is one reason why Jesus built his church. This is a place of instruction. You know, Jesus told Peter, uh, entertain my sheep, right? Remember that? What? Did I say something wrong? Entertain? Oh, he said, feed my sheep. That was an intentional slip on my part. Because today, so much of what calls itself the church is set about to entertain people. Not preach them the gospel, uh, letting them know they need to be saved from sin and get right with God, live a holy life. But they come together with the programs and the entertainment and things like that. And let me just say this, there's, there's nothing wrong with programs, activities, and things like this. It's good to have them. But Jesus did tell us, feed my sheep. So our job is not to entertain, but first and foremost to teach and to instruct. So, yes, you need to faithfully read your Bible, but you also need to come to church, uh, not just to the preaching service, but to the Sunday school and to the other um, um, you know, seminars and things that, that we put out because there is where we get into the study of the Word of God in a deeper way, uh, even deeper than just the preaching service. Jesus commanded us to feed his sheep. It is our place then to feed God's people on the words of Jesus. And it is our place as God's people to learn and to grow in the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is an inseparable connection between love and obedience. 
One cannot exist without the other. Now in saying to keep his word, that means to keep what Jesus taught in its entirety. That means everything that he taught us, right? His teachings then are to influence the things that we like or dislike, thereby regulating our conduct, what we do. And in order to be like Jesus, you must follow and obey what he taught. The neglect or refusal to do so makes any professed love for Christ a lie. So, again, do you love Jesus? Are you keeping his word? Jesus gives a definite, definite divine promise to all who keep his word. And this promise has two parts. The first is that the Father will love you. Wow, that's great. And the second is even greater, is that the Father and Jesus will come and make their home with you. Now, God loves all mankind. God so loved the world, okay? But there is a special degree of love he has for those that follow and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. That love first assures us that our sins are indeed forgiven. And then second, it assures us that God is very much aware of us in our circumstances of life and that God will minister grace to us to live for him in those very circumstances. It is with this love and grace that we are in fact enabled to be faithful and to keep those words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just to have God's love is really more than we could want. But there is far more we receive in that both the Father and the Son come to indwell the very life and spirit of every believer. Now the concept of the Father and Son indwelling people may be difficult to understand. It's a little bit beyond our grasp. God is omnipresent, okay? God is omnipresent, which means he is everywhere all the time and he is not limited or confined to a specific place. God is here today in this very building in and around the city of Lawton, Comanche County and so forth like that, all right? So how then can the Father and the Son live in a person. It is in the uninterrupted union of communication and personal awareness that we are always in the personal presence of God. God is everywhere. He's in Lawton. But people don't recognize, don't see him, are not aware of his presence in Lawton. But God is with us in a special way because we recognize his presence and we know that God is here with us. So it's as if your spirit is plugged into God as an appliance is plugged into an outlet and then powered by the electricity. God lives in us in that way. We're plugged into God. And he energizes us to live for him. Jesus goes on to talk about the helper, whom he calls the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, in fact, the third person of the Godhead, co-equal with the Father and the Son, and always present in all the working of God. The word helper is a Greek word, the literal meaning of which is summoned or called to one's side. It is translated comforter, advocate, helper, 
and counselor in many Bible versions. And in the context of what Jesus says, it suggests that helper is really the best rendering of this word here. First of all, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is indeed sent by the Father and the Son, so he really is summoned. But secondly, Jesus says that he will do what? He will teach you all things. Wow, that is a powerful statement. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. This is really the major work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And it's something that most Christians are really not aware of and really do not take advantage of. So we see from what Jesus says that the Holy Spirit is called to our side for a specific purpose. Now, he's not called to make us speak in an unknown tongue. He's not called to make us, make us feel excited. His purpose, then, is not religious. Instead, it is moral and spiritual. He is sent to our side to be our helper in obeying the words of Jesus. That's why Jesus called him the helper. I do trust we all read the Bible and that we especially read the Gospels. Yes, those first four books of the New Testament are so important to us. So why place so much emphasis on the Gospels? Friends, those are the words of Jesus. So, we realize Jesus gave us over 140 commands in the Gospels. Does anyone here remember all of those commands? Anybody stand up and recite? Oh, no, no I see heads shaking. Anyone out there listening to this uh, on social media, do you know all 40 commands? Actually, there's more. Well, probably not. So, how can you keep 140 commands you do not remember? Well, that's why we need the divine helper. Jesus promised that the helper will bring to your remembrance all things that he taught. If you love Jesus and you have read and are determined to keep his commands, Today, you might be able to write down five or six of them. But when a situation comes up in life where one of those 140 commands applies, it is the work of the Holy Spirit to bring that word to you when you need it. What a blessed privilege is ours. We don't have to have a photographic memory to follow Jesus. We must have real love that commits us to him in faithfulness. And he says, here is the Holy Spirit in you to help you. I know I gave you a lot of instructions, things that are important, things that you must follow, things that must regulate your life. And you're human. You can only retain so much. But the Holy Spirit is there as you live your life in your home, at your job, out in public, in your private life, in your thoughts, when you're watching television, reading books, talking with people. The Holy Spirit is there to bring to your remembrance what you need in every given circumstance of life. When temptation comes, is anyone here ever tempted? Okay, uh, I see some people are in fact tempted. When you're tempted, the Holy Spirit is there to teach you, to bring to your remembrance what Jesus taught you so that you know how to deal with this temptation. When you're tempted to tell a fib, you know what a fib is, don't you? 
It's a big, black, dirty lie. Okay? Well, I just fudged on the truth a little bit. It's a big, black, dirty lie. False witness. And what does one of the Ten Commandments say? Thou shalt not bear false witness. In other words, don't lie. Steal. Say nasty, horrible things. And on and on and on and on. You know, those are things that surround us in the world. And some of that comes around us. Thank God. When that temptation comes, the Holy Spirit is there to, to remind us of what Jesus taught us through his words and through his example. So why do we need this divine helper? Isn't it just enough to believe in Jesus? That's really what I think most Christians are taught today. As long as you believe in Jesus, you're okay. No. There are more fundamental issues at stake than just believing. And the big one, my friends, is obeying his word. The reason we need this helper is seen in God's dealing with mankind through history. Through history. You know, we are living at, towards the end of history. And we have a blessing that other people have not had in that we can look back over history and we can see how God has dealt with people and we can learn from that and apply what we see to our life in this day and age. God, we see, created human beings with a spiritual and moral nature that was in his own image. We know that man disowned God's image through sin. And that sin has affected the human race since that time. When Adam sinned, he drove the Spirit of God out of his life. And without the Spirit of God, Adam was left with a warped sense of morality that separated him from God in what is called spiritual death. That condition has been transmitted through every generation of humans on earth. Theologically, this is called native depravity without demerit. It is depravity what is because of what is called deprivation, or depravity by deprivation. Deprivation is the fact that people are conceived into being without the Holy Spirit in their being. They are deprived of his presence and their moral compass is directed to the knowledge of evil and the flesh thus producing acts of sin that is the beginning God's dealing with this condition began immediately after the fall in the garden of Eden in the early chapters of the book of Genesis we see mostly sin and sinning with the exception of only a few people, such as Enoch, who walked with God. And from the time of the fall, God left mankind to his natural moral responsibility. Being moral beings, people knew the difference between right and wrong. And during this time, there was a simple system of sacrifices that reminded mankind of his need for forgiveness. But history shows that the human race continued in disobedience and descended deeper into sin to the point where God had to intervene with the great flood in which he destroyed the earth's population except for eight people. The next dealing was through the law of Moses and the sacrificial rituals that illustrated man's moral accountability to God. God gave the Ten Commandments to define specific moral actions that are sin. The Ten Commandments were expanded in the rules of the Mosaic Law that applied those moral standards of the commandments to everyday situations. And then there was also a complex system 
of sacrifices that dealt with committed sins of various kinds and various degrees. And there was also the enforcement of the penalty of death because of sin. Remember, God told Adam, in the day that you sin, you will surely die. Well, many of the commandments and principles under the law of Moses were punished by physical death. One of the Ten Commandments is to honor your father and mother. And you know what the penalty for disobeying and dishonoring your parents was under the law of Moses? Being stoned. People would throw rocks at you until you're dead. That's how important the influence and authority of parents is over children. We all need that authority to guide our lives. And if God has given you good, godly parents, be thankful to God and let them be that leader. And when your years of rebellion and wanting to do your own thing come your way, always keep that commandment in, line, in your mind. Now, in our lesson today, Jesus tells us of God's final dealing with man's moral accountability to God. See, our own moral responsibility did not help us. The law and sacrifices did not help us. So God now sends the divine helper for the purpose of changing our moral nature. Knowledge and religious practice did not change us in the past and it cannot change us today. We must have the change only God can perform. And that, my friends, <clears throat> is the new birth. And Jesus taught us in John 3, verse 8, that to be born again is to be born of the Spirit. And as the Holy Spirit enters the life and spirit of a person, he cleanses away all sin through the virtue of the blood of Christ and then he reorients the moral compass to the knowledge of good and the spirit leading to works of righteousness and not sin. The giving of the helper, the Holy Spirit, is essential for the Christian experience of salvation. It's not an option. It's absolutely necessary. We have much more than just a religion. We have much more than just, just a set of beliefs, much more than just hopes that we are in a right relationship with God. The Holy Spirit is our assurance of salvation as the Apostle John wrote in 1 John 4, verse 13. He says, by this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Or as the living Bible paraphrase says, he has put his own Holy Spirit into our hearts as proof to us that we are living with him and he with us. How simple, how beautiful, and how fundamental. The coming of the Holy Spirit in our lives gives us something the unregenerate world can never experience. <clears throat> Jesus describes this in verse 27 of our text this way. He said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. He says, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The teachings of Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide and to keep us in those teachings brings about a peace that is incomprehensible to the world around us. The world might clamor and beg for peace among nations and among people, but so few people ever find peace in their own hearts. The mutual love we share with the living Christ, 
the confidence of the presence of the divine helper and the knowledge that we are in fact obeying the word of Christ puts our conscience at rest. We are at peace with our creator God. Amen. And then we are at peace with our own self. Do you have this peace in your heart? Are you keeping the word of Christ? And do you know that you have the divine helper with you to teach you all things Christ taught? You can have these things. The choice is yours. And God stands ready to give them to you. Amen.